Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Welcome to the river. Amen. Where Sunday morning is the best time of the week. Amen. Amen. Just look at somebody that you can see eye to eye and say, I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you came. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. The atmosphere of gratitude is one where God can do anything. Anything is possible. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. That's another step beyond gratitude. Gratitude is awesome. It's a state of mind and, and being. But then when you give thanks, you've got to give it, express it, let it out. And we sang, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Amen? Amen, amen. Before our children are dismissed to class. We're, we've, we've spent a little more time this morning in, in ministry, ministering, amen? And, and that's okay. We're going we're gonna to just take a deep breath and enjoy the, the next few minutes together. God's got some good things in store for us. Before they go to class, I want to share with you, how many of you remember uh, missionary Tim Taylor? Raise your hand. He was with us a few times on Wednesdays, and Tim and his wife are traveling around the world, doing great works for the Lord, establishing churches in cities that most of us will never go to, cities most of us have never even heard about. You know the world is bigger than Lancaster, Ohio. It really is, and uh, bigger than Ohio even. But they are going to Uganda in just a couple of weeks in the month of June, and we're going to help send them. They've been having meetings with anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people would gather. He shared a testimony in his last newsletter with us that uh, and by the way, if you want to get these newsletters and connect with these missionaries directly, that's perfectly in order. And you can do that through our church office. Just say, sign me up for those Tim Taylor updates and, and newsletters, and you can do that. But he shared with us in our recent newsletter that they were walking down the road and they noticed this crippled boy was really having a hard time. And the Holy Spirit prompted them to stop and pray. They began to pray for this young man, and a crowd gathered around. See, in, in our culture, you might spread people if you start praying like that in public. People might walk way around. This is weird. But in a hungry culture... They want to see what's going on. Their mind's not filled with the latest and greatest technology and sports and all, you know, whatever it is we get hung up on. But a crowd gathered around. And before it was over, the young man was healed. They said he got about 70% to where he's going to be. But the crowd watching this grew. He said it reminded him of what he read about in the New Testament. Yes, and before it was over, 150 people 
give their heart to Jesus Christ. They've been baptizing hundreds and, and twice as many healings in meeting after meeting after meeting. So we don't talk a lot about missions work. We, we have a lot of missionaries that we support as a part of our giving from the tithe that we receive from the congregation here and from online viewers. But reach in front of you and pick up one of those envelopes and put your finger on the word missions. We have missionaries in Belize, Uganda, <laughs> Nepal, um, Sudan. We have a Christian school in Sudan that the river supports uh, on a regular basis. And all over the world, we, the Philippines, we're involved with uh, missions work in Israel and different places. So put your finger on that little spot there. There's a blank place there, and that blank place gives you the opportunity to support, connect, make covenant with people you will never see until eternity. The people you know here for 60, 70, 80, 90, if you have a friend that you've had for 90 years, you're doing good. But these people that you're touching right now with your finger, you will spend eternity with. You're going to get to know them real good. You're going to hear some testimonies that will blow your mind. Amen? And you're going to get love like you've never been loved when you touch some of those people. Amen? Who Jesus did great and mighty things for and reached hundreds for him. So today, if you would... Write an amount on there, pray over it, ask God to show you what you can do. And on your way out, just make sure you put something in the box for missions. And today, uh, Jack, if you would, from today and this coming Wednesday, all loose cash, we're going to put that to missions. How about that? So if you don't get a chance to write it down, you just drop money in. It's all going to missions. And we're going to send it around the world. We're going to bless Tim and Eunice Taylor, and they are going to be our hands and feet in another place. Amen? Hold up your envelope, your wallet, your phone, your device, your Wi-Fi connection, whatever it is you used to give. If you're watching us from home, hold it up at home, and let's declare to the Lord, I declare that as sure as God's rainbow is in the clouds, my covenant is established in Him. I believe his promises to me are yes and amen. This is my covenant kept in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Children, jump up and go to class and don't run. But be eager to learn and listen and hear what the Lord is saying to you today. Amen. Hi, Richard. How are you? Your name Richard? I thought I met you years ago. <clears throat> Mary Coran is in the house, everybody. <clears throat> she brought Richard with her to the river. Welcome, you guys. Welcome. Good to see the shirt singers. Look at there. Catherine, where, where did Richie go? He went out. He escaped. He got a word this morning. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I, I looked at Pastor Lois this morning and I said, what in the world would it look like if every fear in this room just disappeared? Woo! Can you imagine what we would do with the absence of fear just for a few minutes? I, I'd just take 10 minutes of what it would look like in this room with the absence of fear off of us. I speak in the name of Jesus. God is breaking fear 
off of hearts, minds in this room, tormenting spirits. You've got to go. Your sleep is going to return. Your peace is going to return according to the word of the Lord. Let it be so. Somebody shout amen. 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 Woo! Wednesday night, I'm not going to sing. Wednesday night, a lady sitting right back there gave, gave a vision that she had had. We were praying over her, and she had a vision that she was walking through a field of flowers, and then she looked up, and then all of a sudden, it wasn't flowers, it was mustard. And God gave a word through another lady to her that he surrounded you with mustard seed faith. Uh, this morning, I'm doing what I do back there, just worshiping in my shoes all over the building. And Brother Danny, my precious brother with a gift, he has a gift of word of knowledge on him. And he looked at me and he said, Today, God wants to give somebody mustard seed faith that anything is possible. Something, is that, did I get that about right? Mustard seed faith is in the room. Well, the Lord said, you're surrounded by mustard seed faith Wednesday and confirmed it today. I don't know what you're waiting on. Anything is possible. If that don't get your attention, then I really don't have much. I, I, that, that rings my bell all day long. Amen? Amen. We want to welcome our guests with us today. It's good to see so many of you in the house of the Lord, and some are here for their very first time, and we would love to connect with you. And if, you're, if there's a card in front of you that says, first time, Look at that, write, it, write your name, and if you want to give us an email or something, we'll, we'll just make sure we reach out. But if there's a second time card in front of you, and you have been here more than once, we would really like for you to fill that out and give us enough to connect with you in a real powerful way. July the 9th will be our starting of our Pathways class, and that just helps you to just find your way right on into Serving the Lord and being connected to a church family. Everybody needs a church family. And uh, being connected and submitted and plugged in and praying together and serving together is a powerful, powerful way. It's God's only way uh, for his family. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And nobody's invented anything better than that since he said that. And he will build it. And I've been working 28 years trying to get out of the way. And let him build his church. Come on, somebody. Amen? I want to welcome Uncle Herb. Herb Campbell, come up here. Or stand down there. It don't matter. Whatever you're comfortable. I want you to greet these people and say hello from Madisonville. Hello from Madisonville. <laughs> it's always great to be at the Lord. I'm telling you, it's such a. I don't know why everybody's not here. I, I really don't Amen. understand. <laughs> but it's always wonderful to be with the bishops. They're such graceful hosts, and Ben and Lindsay, and of course, they're my family, but uh, this has become my family too. Amen. Amen. While he's here, he has been drawing sketches and ideas to expand that back wall. Amen. Last Sunday, they said we had 439 chairs and 440 people. So that, that means we need some more chairs and some more place to put chairs. Jim, Jim don't think we can get 100 more chairs in here, but I'm going to show him. We're going to figure it out. We'll figure it out. And uh, no, he knows we can. He just, he likes to keep everybody comfortable and happy. And I'm thankful 
for that. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful that God gave us this room. And I, I did a little quick thinking, calculating, and uh, what it cost us to move from that room over there to this room, which more than doubled our capacity in seating. For half that much, we can double this capacity because, because we planned on it. We, 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 we prepared ahead of time for this building to be expanded that way, put our platform on that side, and everything going around. It's uh, really neat, and I can't wait to share 3D colored pictures with you of what God is doing. Today, I want to share a message that I feel like the Lord gave me, and I, I hope he did. I don't want to speak for anyone other than him. Amen? Uh, but uh, his word is so rich, and there's so much in it, and I just love digging and uncovering treasures and sharing them with all of you and watching you smile when I share and hear you shout amen. Amen? So it's been about three or four weeks since I ministered in this pulpit, I think. I've been having all these other people come up, and uh, I tell you, they're a hard act to follow if, if, if we're looking at it that way, but there's some good, good teachers and preachers in this house. Amen. Today, amen. Today, I'm going to share from the subject, the sweet aroma of servitude. The sweet aroma of of servitude. I'll start with a poem introduction. Y'all got your Bible ready? This is not in the Bible. It's titled, He's No Stranger. He's the wisest man in the church. There's nothing he can't do. If you turn down your ministry, he'll be there for you. He's also a very faithful member. He shows up right on time. If you don't honor your commitment, he'll cover you every time. He's obviously very wealthy. The plates always passed his way. If you choose not to give a cent, he'll all the expenses pay. Who is he, you may ask? This one with such acclaim Thank God he's in every church. Somebody else is his name. <laughs> Written by Lloyd Taylor. There's a lot to be said for that somebody else. Thankfully at the river, we all are trying to be somebody else that's needed in the church. The Bible, in summary, is a love book or a love letter, 66 books of love. Love, in summary, is giving. The most precious gift you have is your time, your presence, or your service to others. We serve... Because we love. The old song written probably in the 40s or 50s, I will serve thee because I love thee. Jan, you know that song, don't you? You have given life to me. It's a beautiful song. More beautiful if someone else sings it, but it's a beautiful song. But you can turn to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26. The spark that kind of set me off into this message was a conversation between a couple of four-year-olds, five-year-olds in the foyer last Sunday after church. Aubrey Jr., son of Aubrey and Jordan Hansen, walks up to Victory, the little daughter of Tyler and Krista, Dave Kiner's grandbaby, well, he walks up to her and he says, Victory, 
How can I serve you? She looked at him like he had three heads. <laughs> what? She said, how can I serve you, Victory? What's serve mean? So Aubrey's scratching his head trying to come up with a better word. He said, you know, help you. Do something. Yeah, he, he's trying to give her a five-year-old definition of serve. I got a feeling there's a whole lot of us scratching our head, still trying to define who we are when it comes to the area of serving others, serving the Lord. However, it is, as you will find out today, if you don't already know, the core of the Christian life. It is what we were made to do. I was made in his likeness, created in his image. I was born to serve the Lord. One of the first songs we taught in kindergarten when we had the Christian school in Mississippi was, I was born to serve the Lord. People say, Oh, I don't know why I was born. I wish I'd have never been born. I don't understand why. You know, no, 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 no. You were made in his likeness, created in his image. You were born to serve the Lord. The earlier you learn that and the more deeply you get that in your spirit, the better off you will be. Matthew 20, verse 26. We'll start in the middle of the verse. The greatest among you will live as the one who called to serve others. I'm reading the Passion. So, Verse 27. Because the greatest honor and authority is reserved for the one with the heart of a servant. Verse 28. For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life in exchange for the salvation of many. The Son of Man, it speaks of Jesus, capital S-O-N. He did not come to be exalted or praised or waited on hand and foot, but to serve. No matter who you are, no matter how high your level of service may be, the only reason people should be serving you is to make it possible for you to serve more. That was pretty good. I just made that up. Write it down. It's good. One of the key components of identifying emerging leaders is to observe how they serve existing leaders. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me. This is King James, so y'all can all get to read it. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That word as in that verse means in the way that. So let's read it with that definition. Be ye followers of me even in the way that I also am of Christ. How you see me following Christ, that's how you follow me. That's a powerful truth to be embraced by a Christian and a believer in this room and in this church and in the days that we are living in. If you find somebody that's a true follower of Jesus and you follow them in the way they are following Jesus, you're going to line yourself up with everything that God has and his word is going to become part of your life and your being 
And you're going to be made more into his image every day that you walk, every step that you take. Amen? We do this as a congregation, but we also do it as, as groups. One of the main reasons for you to be in a grow group is to find other people that are following Jesus in, a, in such a way that you can... If you feel like you're following Jesus better than anybody else you know, you're in trouble. You've got a real problem on your hands. I remember a famous minister uh, known far and wide fell into an immoral act. And somebody said, you need to go and get counsel. You need to get some help. You need to submit to some authority. And he said, who in the world would I submit to? There's your problem. There's your problem. Let not a man think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Jesus served his disciples. They didn't follow him around like an entourage, just doing his bidding and waiting on him hand and foot. That's the image we get. Because we are more accustomed to, you know, the Godfather and the the men's and boys clubs and, you know, the, the celebrity Christianity. But Jesus wasn't about celebrity Christianity. John chapter 13 and verse 1, one of my favorite readings in all of the Bible. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Let's just, let's just hang out right there. I like that verse 3. You can serve in every capacity, you can do anything God requires of you if you know what Jesus knew. Part of what we need to be good at serving is to know some things. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Now, knowing that, some of us would really get excited and get exalted and be filled with pride and no, do no telling what. But pay attention to what Jesus did, knowing that he had all things given to him from God and that he had come from God and was going to God. So, number one, put this in your notes, please. Number one, you need to know where you came from. If, you, if they've screwed with your mind and, and you think you came from a monkey, you need to get that fixed. Paula's little joke last week, by the way, was awesome. That was funny. I laughed at that joke. But you did not come from a monkey. Why are y'all so quiet? <laughs> this is a Holy Ghost church, amen? You believe the Bible, right? <laughs> knowing he came from God and knowing he was going back to God. Boy, that, there's so much in that right there. You can find some serious peace sitting down in your chair and knowing that you came from God. God, you are not an accident. 
You are not just a product of somebody's pleasure. You came from God. He meant for you to be here. He meant for you to be who you are. He meant for you to look the way you look. He called your name. He chose you from before the foundation of the world. You came from God. And anytime you try to be something else that God didn't intend for you to be, you're going to just mess it up worse. Relax. Be who you are. You came from God. The next thing the world don't know, but it's our gospel to preach to them, you're going back to God. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going to end up. And I don't need to know who I'm more. Help me. I said, I know where I came from and I know where I'm going to end up. I don't need to know a whole lot more about the trip. Woo! Ha! Somebody holds a gun in your head and says, don't threaten me with heaven. You're not going to get much out of me. You're going to have to find a better deal to trade with me. Ha! <laughs> I know where I'm going. And by the way, I know where you're going. <laughs> no. Love them. <laughs> if you know where you came from, and you know you have all things from God, and you know where you're going, now you're equipped. Now you're ready. Now you can do anything. Now you can do exactly what God called you to do. Yes. Yes. We could just go home right now. So what did Jesus do when he knew he had all things and he knew where he came from and he knew where he was going? He rose up from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. He didn't build three tabernacles. He didn't start planning a trip. He didn't order two jets. He robed himself in a towel. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel which he was girded. Wait a minute, Pastor. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. I know I have all things from God. Maybe I ought to just record some sermons on a blog. That'd be good. Maybe I ought to write a book, publish it, and be famous. Uh, that's not what Jesus did. Started washing feet. Uh, that's kind of disgusting in, to me. I mean, I'm not that crazy about washing somebody's feet. Amen? But Jesus did it. Literally put his hands that had never hurt anybody, his healing hands on their feet. And I'm not going to teach on that today, but there's a whole lot to be learned about that. Um, procedure and, and doing that, and it's okay for us to do it now. Yeah. Amen? Amen. He came to Peter, and Peter said, Lord, would you going to wash my feet? <laughs> Jesus said to him, what I'm doing to you, you don't understand now, but you will know after this. See, sometimes God's got to do stuff to you that you don't understand. Because he knows that if you'll let him do it, then you can understand it. Amen? How many of you didn't understand speaking in tongues, but after you did it, you were like, oh, that's what they are doing. Oh, I get it now. Didn't understand the blood applied until you got baptized in water and the name of Jesus was put on you. And then you're like, oh, now I see what I'm into. Woo! Amen. <clears throat> the Lord said, or Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. <laughs> Have you ever said that? I'll never. Ah, you got to watch that word. <laughs> that word will come back to bite you, won't it? I'll never. Now don't say never. 
<laughs> Jesus answered him and said, If I do not wash your feet, you will have no part with me. Peter said, Oh, okay, well, you put it like that. Lord, why don't you go ahead and wash my feet, my hands, my head? Just give me a bath. I'm ready. You ever been there just desperate to have all that God has? And once you realize what he's t getting at and what he's doing, you know, okay, God, I'm in, all in. Wash my hands and my head while you're at it. I've been feeling a little dusty. Amen? Peter got all in. Jesus said to him, who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. This he was talking about Judas, who even though Jesus washed his feet, he still wasn't clean in heart. What Jesus is essentially saying here is, if I cannot work on you, I cannot work through you. Write that down. If he can't work on you, then he's never going to be able to work through you. Say this prayer with me. Lord, work on me so you can work through me. Work through me, God. Work through me. There's so much healing that comes through the aroma, the sweet aroma of servitude. The Lord gave me this word yesterday. Depression cannot survive in the house of the sweet aroma of servitude. Depression cannot survive in the house of the sweet aroma of servitude. In 8, 8 of 08, at about 5 in the morning, no, earlier, 2 or 3 in the morning, my insulin injection that I take at like 10 or 11 at night I had given myself the wrong medication. And I went into a full-blown seizure. I bit my tongue into completely through in two different places. I threw my back out in, in so, so badly that my thoracic muscles were torn from my ribs. And I dislocated a couple of discs in my back. They took me to the ER. I came around to myself at 6 or 7 o'clock that day. Didn't know where I was or anything. And a spirit of fear gripped our home because of the risk of that happening again and it being a fatal uh, attack somebody say but God, but God. Amen. in the months that followed I went into depression people go through depression some of you have been through depression it's not because you're bad it's not because you entertain not always because you entertain negative thoughts Sometimes it can be onset by an attack. It can be onset by post-traumatic stress, things of that nature. One day a man of God in this church that would wish to not be named came up to me in, in the church over in the old building and he said, I've heard from the Lord he told me to have you bring me a pair of your dress shoes every Sunday morning and give them to me 
and I'm to take them home and polish them with a military shine and bring them back to you the next Sunday and exchange them for another pair of your dress shoes indefinitely. Very humbling to me. Oh, man. Ah. But when someone says the Lord moved on them to do something, That's right. never been served in that way, never understood what it was, but what was happening was the same thing that Jesus did to his disciples when he washed their feet. See, when you walk through this earth, you don't pick what all gets on your feet. The disciples walked through places in the street where the animals had been walking and they got stuff on their feet. Stuff that didn't smell good. They didn't mean to. They got dust on them. The dust of the ground, the stuff that the serpent was cursed to eat was on their feet. Jesus washed it off so wherever they went, the serpent didn't follow them to he had nothing to eat. You like that? Think about that. Amen. Took the bait off their feet. Amen. The bait of Satan. You, you can serve others in such a way that the bait of Satan, the offense that people carry, is washed off of them by your love. I'm going to tell you right now, on about the 10th or 12th pair of shoes... That depression lifted off of me by the Spirit of the living God, by the power of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't, it wasn't a famous evangelist anointing me with oil and praying over me and me and being slain in the Spirit, which is awesome and powerful and wonderful, but that's not how God chose to do that. It wasn't somebody fasting for 30 days over me, and it wasn't me reading 100 scriptures a day and positive. It wasn't power of positive thinking. It wasn't a drug or a medication. It was somebody serving in a way that the Holy Spirit prompted. It was the power of hospitality. Depression cannot survive the house of hospitality. Depression cannot survive where people are serving others with a heart of love, with the heart of Jesus, with the heart of a servant in humble ways. Jesus gave his disciples something in that room that they would reflect on in the days to come. <laughs> How are you going to make it through when your king is crucified? How are you going to get by when you watch him beaten by those nasty Roman soldiers? How are you going to get by when the Roman government condemns him to death right before your eyes? What are you going to do about it? I'm going to remember a night in a room with my Lord where I sat down and he got in front of me and he washed my feet. How do you know you're somebody? How do you know where you came from? How do you know where you're going? How do you know you have all things from God? Because somebody loved me enough to wash my feet. Somebody loved me enough to get in front of me. Somebody loved me enough to bake me a pan of cookies when my wife was sick and bring them over to the house so we could have something sweet on the table. Somebody loved me enough to come over and do my laundry. Somebody loved me enough to drive my kids to school when I was too occupied to get there. Somebody cared enough to come over in the middle of the night and check my baby's temperature when I was too sick to help. It's a hurting world. You're sitting around people that are carrying some heavy stuff and you can lift it off of them just by shining their shoes, washing their feet. Paula and I picking up our breakfast this morning and Sitting in the drive through window, the lady just starts showing us pictures of a baby. Two-year-old little girl. Prettiest thing you ever saw. Blue eyes and blonde hair. Who is this? She said, well, she's a relative to a friend. and She'd been missing. 
we found her in a car all alone, covered in feces. We cleaned her up. And that baby's brilliant. That baby knows her colors. And she's potty trained herself in my house. I brought her in. I'm going to take care of her. I'm going to be guardian for her. I'm going to care for her and love her. Because drugs has wrecked her daddy. Drugs has wrecked her mommy. They can't be mommy and daddy anymore. I'm going to love this baby to health. She's going to have a home. She's going to have peace. That's washing feet. That's some, that's some hospitality at work. And you know what's going to happen? God's going to deliver that mommy. God's going to deliver that daddy. Because somebody cared more. You become more than a number. I wish I had about three hours with y'all. Y'all are fun. I like y'all. Amen. Well, you know, Dustin, I got to give the how, right? I mean, you can't just get people. So five things that hinder us from serving. Number one is knowing our purpose. It's a quest that we all get on. One of the first questions to ask yourself is, what am I good at? And don't tell me you're good at nothing, because then I'll already know what you're good at, and that's lying. <laughs> but you're good at something. People love to do what they're good at. Simeon, you want to help me do this? No, Papa. Why? Because he's not good at it. Simeon, you want to kick that soccer ball? Yeah! Why? Because he's good at it. What am I really good at? Hebrews 9 and 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Don't let Christianity and religion convince you that the blood of Jesus was just to get you out of sin. Read this verse. What did it say? From dead works to, to, everybody say, I was saved to. We're good at singing about being saved from sin. But if you don't Quit singing just about being from sin and get saved to something. You'll find yourself sinning again and having to get saved from sin again and from sin again and from sin again until you find something to get saved to. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says you were saved to serve the living God. How many of you were really good sinners? Don't sit there and lie to me. You were good at it. Huh? Now you're not good at it. Say, huh. so why don't you do those things? Because I ain't very good at it. I got the Holy Ghost, and I'm not good at sinning anymore. I tried to just mess it up. You're not good at it. Quit trying. But you are good at serving the Lord, because he saved you to serve. Amen. Yeah. Number two, hindrance to serving is time management. Somebody say, oh, Lord. <laughs> Most of us, it's the fact of letting the urgent preempt the important. Letting the urgent preempt the important. Oh, I got to get this done. I got to get that done. I got, oh, I got 15 minutes. And I got to have that. Got to be, got to be there. Got to be here. Gotta, I'm running late. Ba, 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 ba. 
If running late is in your sentence through the week, you need to fix it. You don't need to live running late. Running late's hard on your blood pressure, hard on you. Running late's not a healthy way to go. No, you don't need to be running late. Why are you running late? Write down something and figure out why you're running late. Once you figure out why you're running late and it's a sin to run late, you'll fix running late. I'm just kidding. It's not a sin. <laughs> but you've got to treat it like it's a sin. If you're in that muck and mess and rut of running late. I hate running late. <sighs> I got to a meeting yesterday three minutes before it started and I, it stressed me. <sighs> 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 I was three minutes early, man. I was nailing it. But I don't like it. I want to be 15 minutes early. Number three, why we don't, why, what hinders our serving is we don't really know the why or the cause of serving. David, when he was about to face the giant, his brothers were telling him, you need to get back out there and check on them sheep. Who did you leave the sheep with anyway? He looked at his brother and he said, what are you doing sitting here? Is there not a cause? Sometimes we just need to stop. The ur oh, Getting a hold of them sheep was probably urgent because I don't know what in the world they were doing without a shepherd. But he forsook the urgent and did what was important to, to a nation, to the future, to our history. Him slaying that giant directly impacted you and me. He realized what was important and he said to them, is there not a cause? It's worth my time. It's worth my trouble to do what's important. For the kingdom of God. Ask yourself, what am I passionate about? What is it that stirs me to pull up my bootstraps and get out of bed early and get her done? Amen? And the fourth thing that hinders us from serving is serving the wrong master. Somebody say, ouch. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Whew. Oh, my word. It's a problem. It's a real issue. And too many people try to do both. And I'm telling you, the most confused and disoriented and disturbed and troubled people in the world are people that try to do both. People that are just sold out to their money, boom, they can go out there and just kill it. People that are sold out to Jesus, boom, they're happy, joyful, serving, loving, giving. But you fence straddlers, you Sunday go to meetingers. <laughs> That's a word. <laughs> the CEO Christians, Christmas and Easter only. You're not cutting it. No man can serve two masters. Let me help you. Ephesians 4.28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to... Pay the car payment, pay the house payment, eat supper. What's the Bible say? That he may have something to... Go ahead and show them. I'm, I'm not going to hold them off. Go to the next one. Oh, it's up there. Oh. Ta-da! My, my, my screen's different from yours. Sorry. That he may have to... Give him who has need. When you work... It's not just to keep from stealing. When you work, it's not just to pay the bills. It's not about the Lord provides. You, you say, i got to provide for my family. No, you don't. 
They will not starve to death if you quit your job. God will provide. But don't quit your job. Because then you won't have to give him who has need. If you go to work every day, say, man, I got to get in there and get it done because I'm going to earn some money so I can give. I can't wait to give. I got to work harder. I got to get some overtime because I want to give, 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 give. When you get giving as the impetus for your working, working is a lot more fun. It is more blessed to give than to eat, receive. We're not consumers. We're producers, givers. Look at somebody and say, give. Give. Okay, in closing. I got to land this thing. (laughs) Woo! I got so much more to tell you. But the fifth one, okay, so one is knowing our purpose. Two, time management. Three, knowing the why or the cause. Four, serving the wrong master. And five is lacking power. If you know you got the power, if you possess the power, you can do it. But when you lack power, nothing's going to happen. Yesterday we went and visited a church, and when we walked in, the sanctuary was dark. The pastor said, we got the light switch hidden. And he's six foot five, and he could barely reach over this wall and turn on the lights. He said, a few years ago, somebody broke into our church and didn't steal a thing because they couldn't find the light switch. How many Christians sit on a church pew, pay their tithes and offerings, don't miss a Sunday, but they're not changing anybody's life because they can't find the light switch? I remember years ago we watched the, we were watching television to see them light the Christmas. My wife loves Christmas, by the way to see them light the Rockefeller Plaza Christmas tree and the music builds up and the announcer announces and everybody's standing and they're cheering, they're clapping and nothing happened. You remember that? It didn't come on. (laughs) And it took like an hour for them to figure out what was going on. Almost reminded me of Chevy Chase trying to get his Christmas lights on. No, I'm just kidding. We watched the TV version of that, by the way. (laughs) Anyway. So today in the church, we like the power of Pentecost. We like the power of the Holy Ghost. When the power of the Holy Ghost sweeps our souls and pours out on his church, you're going to see people serving, giving, loving, doing. Hospitality is going to light up your house. Hospitality is going to light up the church. And we'll no longer look at each other like what you're doing here, but we'll look at each other and say, come on in. Welcome home. We love you. We care about you. We want to be a part of your life. We want you to be part of our life. Come on in to the house of the Lord. We have the power. The Bible talks about having a form of godliness, but lacking the power thereof. That power is a power to serve. What did you think it was? <laughs> Amen. We like power because we don't know what we'd do with it if we had it. A lot of people think, man, I want that power. I want that glory. I want to heal the sick, raise the dead, da 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 Hey, cook somebody some soup. It takes power to do that. Go clean somebody's house, mow somebody's grass, rake somebody's leaves, help somebody move. It takes power to do that. And it's powerful. Shining somebody's shoes can break off depression. I tell you, hospitality is powerful. So a woman, I won't read the scripture, but if you want to study it at home when you have more time than I have been given today, Luke 7 and verse 36 through 46, a woman with an alabaster box shows up in a house. The atmosphere of that home was reeking with religiosity, Phariseeism, Christianity and its politics. Who's the greatest? Who's the least? This woman shows up of ill repute. We, we might not, 
we might want to credential her, you know, I mean, we might want to vet her out a little, might not want to be seen in town with her. She shows up and she chooses to do what Jesus needed in the moment. She chose to break her treasure box open. All of her life savings was in that and poured it on his feet and began to wash his feet and dry them with her hair. And all of a sudden, the atmosphere in that room went from Judas complaining about the money that was wasted and the Pharisees looking down on her and pointing their finger. Don't he know what she is? Don't he? Man, 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 man. Oh, I've been around them religious spirits and they still make me mad and they're not even in here. But it went from that to the sweet aroma of servitude. In a moment, you can change the atmosphere of the world you live in, of the place you work, the place you occupy, the house you visit, the hospital room, the church service. It can be changed in a moment from a nasty old, ugly old turmoil spirit to a place of peace, safety, security, Love and rest. Stand with me today. I walked into this room today and I smelled the sweet smell of sacrifice. I saw greeters at the door, ushers with their badges on, people running around to the cameras and the sound board and going up to the equipment to make our presentations to us and people straightening chairs and picking up things and looking for someone to love, someone to hug, so children play. And this room was filled with the sweet aroma of servitude. Someone answers emails, answers phone calls, writes cards to our guests. and Love and servitude is rich in this room. I watched as a weary saint walks to the front of the room and says, I have a need. And all of a sudden, out of those seats, people pop up and run down and grab a bottle of oil, grab a hand to hold, touch somebody on the shoulder begin to anoint and pray. I watched his men weep because their brother's hurting. What does it take to get you out of your seat? What does it take to get you to commit to every Wednesday? What does it take to get you to sign up, to serve, to love, to give? Oh, I know somebody hurt your feelings one time and you didn't like the way that was run and blah, 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 blah. But there's a power to get free from that. There's a power to overcome that. There's a power to set you free to serve. Jesus Christ shed his blood, releasing you to serve. Somebody say amen. When you serve God's servants, you create a climate of garden fresh flowers. When you follow like he follows, you warm the room temperature that turns cold hearts into melted hearts of flesh to receive him. I honor you today if you're serving in the house. I bless you. I hope you go away from here today Saying, Lord, how can I serve you more? What, do I, what am I good at? What can I do? I'm not going to put you on the spot to sign your name onto anything. But I just wonder if there's anybody in this room that would step out of your seat and be the first one to come down here and say to the Lord, I will serve you because I love you. 
Is there anyone here today, you've been serving the world, you've been serving yourself, you've been serving mammon, money, job, pleasure, and you say, I want Jesus to be the one, the center of my life. I want, G I want to serve Jesus and him only. Step out and come down here with me. Nobody's going to hurt you. Nobody's going to mess with you. We'll, we love you. We'll help you. We'll pray with you. Commit. Come on. Make that step out. Make that commitment. That's it. That's it. Lord, show me my place. Uh, put me in your service, teenagers. You're getting ready to graduate high school. You're getting ready to be out for the summer. What are you going to do for God? How are you going to serve your fellow man? I love you, Jesus. I want to serve you, Jesus. Amen. Oh, everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Oh, I, I give myself to you. Yes, everything, everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Holding nothing with one. I give you all of me. 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 I give you all of me, I give you all of me, I give you all of me, I give myself Give it all to him. I give myself away. I want you to take your hands. We're going to dismiss in just a little bit. All the impact fellowship are going to go first. But just look at your hands. This is going to be our prayer focus today. Is as you look at your hands, say, God, cleanse my hands with your blood for your service. Give me a passion to serve in your kingdom. Give me a passion to serve my neighbor. Give me a passion, Lord, to serve my family. I love you, Jesus. I will serve you all the days of my life. Help me, Lord. I believe you. I trust you to use my hands for your glory in Jesus name now put those hands together and praise the Lord maker of heaven and earth holy are you Lord holy are you Lord glory to your name oh. okay I'm going to start right up here if you're single and you're between the age of 18 and 30, raise your hand. I got two on the platform. 
Keep them up. And turn around. Put your guitar down. Put your guitar down. And walk out there to the family room. Go. Go. Dave Kiner waits. Give myself away. So you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself to you, Lord. I give myself. I give myself away. Use me, Lord. My life is not my own. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself to you. Hey. mess with me. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. I bless you. I love you. Give a few hugs. Don't, 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 don't sneak out. Give some hugs. Have a great afternoon. God loves you. The river loves you. Please, we'll see you soon. Wednesday night at seven. Holly, you or Jeremy one coming in. One of either one or both doesn't matter.